Within the letter to Revelation, one of the greatest themes is worship and praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord who was and who is and who is to come. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. King of kings, Lord of lords. There's a terrible lot happening as we read the letter of Revelation, but yet it is interrupted continually by praise. They sang a new song. We thought of that at the beginning of Revelation chapter 14 in the third verse. They sang a new song. We love singing, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. And yet these verses from Revelation, verses 14 to the end of the chapter, in chapter 14, it is the one who is worthy of that praise we meet. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he had two a, a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of 16,000 stadia. In this it is judgment day, it is judgment time. The time to judge the earth had come. They were told to fear God and to give him the glory. When we find our lives are despondent or caught by the things of this earth, have we done what the psalmist said, perfected praise? Our lips declare the mercy and the goodness of God. And as we thought last time of Mary, the mother of Christ, my soul magnifies the Lord. Often when we are despondent in life, we need to see the vision of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in seeing that vision, want to open our mouths and say, worthy is the lamb who is slain to redeem us unto God. This portion at the end of Revelation 14 is the judgment time. The gospel eternally had been directed to every tribe and nation and language and people. Fear God, give him the glory. The idea of those who were faithful had been thought of. Patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments, God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. But it is judgment time. A solemn time. No more waiting. No more excuse, no more delay. Verse 14 of Revelation 14. I looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one, like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. On the cloud, one like a son of man, wearing a crown of gold on his head. Jesus wears one crown. The beasts had many crowns, many things, but Christ, when he appears at the end of time to judge the earth, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth, he will wear one crown because there is but one King, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
That should focus us. The things of time, the people who rule on this earth or imagine that they rule on this earth will be brought to nothing and fall before one throne, the throne of God and the Lamb, and cry, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Christ wears one crown. He is the King. He wears one crown, and it is on his head. It sits well there. So in the particular sense, it's not crown him with many crowns, in that everybody should throw their glory and say it is nothing before Christ. But he wears one crown. He, the Lord Jesus Christ, alone is worthy to receive glory and honor and praise and might to the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. We think of three things this morning from this ending of the Revelation 14. Christ came, he came on a cloud, and then the voice came from the temple, and the voice came to the people on the earth. On a cloud, from the temple, on the earth. So this verse again, I looked, said John, and there before me, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. on a cloud, the Son of Man, sing praise to him. Keith Gretty is one who encourages believers to sing praise to God. Don't sing if you love singing alone, or stay silent because you don't think you can sing. Why do we sing? And what do we sing? Keith said this, sing to the praise of God, who loved you, gave you birth, and one day shall come to save or to judge you. Loved you, gave you birth, one day shall come to save or to judge you. We think of Christ who comes, and we want to sing praise to him. But we can't keep life together. I read about a celebrity chef. He's trying to keep his business going in these weeks between lockdown and building a business and helping people in their work. It can be hard and tough. Yet even before that, in trying to keep things together as an employer and a worker and a chef, the demands it has both day and night, in his personal life, 
it became a great pressure just to keep going. And he said getting through the tough days in life is a bit like baking a cake. It just may not turn out the way you imagined, but it still can taste delicious. It just may not turn out the way you imagined, but it still can taste delicious. How is the world at its end going to turn out? In what way will we meet the Lord Jesus wearing that one crown, the crown of the King, the crown of Christ? Because there's just one kingdom. That is why Christ wears one crown. On his head was that crown, a crown of gold on his head, this Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a crown of gold because it is the kingdom crown. We say in the Lord's Prayer, Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. This, the judgment time, is that moment. The kingdom, the power, and the glory. And we pray as we hear, that Christ might speak to us. So firstly, Christ's coming on a cloud. And the one thing that is true on this, because of Christ's coming on the cloud, the saints can sing. Hallelujah, they would cry, for the Lord our God reigneth. Hallelujah. We might be a little bit like that chef, we're trying to get the ingredients of life together. And things may not have turned out as we imagined. But at the end, when God's hand is on his kingdom, his people, those who give God the glory and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and coming King, crowned in glory, then things can, I wouldn't say taste delicious, but turn out tremendous. Some people, when they're struggling, look to Psalm 27 and verse 14. I shall yet see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I shall yet see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This heavenly vision, this on a cloud, it is Christ, his final appearing on the earth. One song that is sung is an old one, "'Tis finished, the Messiah dies, cut off for sin, but not his own. Accomplished is the sacrifice, the great redeeming work is done." The great redeeming work is done. And this final appearing in power and great glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, his saving work is done. The songs of the saints arise, they sing their praise, they lift their voice. But this sense of song is not only a song of rejoicing and freedom and praise and acknowledgement of Christ. The saints are singing their new song because the time of Christ coming to judge the earth has come. It is not just a self-reflecting, oh, marvelous, Jesus is here. They are singing because at last, of all that has happened on this earth, the Lord has come and he will judge the earth. He will sort things out. Because this son of man who bore the crown had another thing he held. One like the Son of Man on the cloud with a crown of gold in his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. He comes in power and great glory. This coming on the clouds, the believers at the Mount of Olives on the Ascension Day, they were told by the angels and also assured by Christ, this same Jesus, who you saw going into heaven shall come again in the same way with the clouds as you have seen him go. And believers in Christ who 
began to wonder, how long will it be? When will Christ come? How long shall we struggle? Where is all this taking us? Paul wrote to them in Thessalonica and said this thing, For the Lord himself will come from heaven with cloud and great command, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall first arise. Then we who are left and shall be caught up with him in the cloud, we shall ever be with the Lord. Lo, he comes in clouds descending. Every eye shall now behold him. We're told in the Bible that these words are true. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Christ is coming in the clouds, but he bears a sickle in his hand. That was the other object. The Son of Man with a crown of gold in his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And a voice comes from the temple so we have on the cloud the declaring of Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, and yet the Lord anointed Savior. But this one who comes and worthy of praise, praise because he is the Lord, he is worthy of that crown, but praise because he is the one who will judge. Because in verse 15, then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud, vo loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. It is now. The harvest of the earth is ripe. The reign of sin and death is o'er, and all may live from sin set free. Satan has lost his mortal power, to swallowed up in victory. The one who bears the sickle. This is not a new thought. Back in the times when the Israeli nation had lost its king and its hope, come back from exile and struggled for sense of help, prophets spoke about this son of man bearing the sickle. Prophets earlier spoke about the harvest time Daniel said, I looked and there was one, like a son of man, coming with clouds of heaven. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. And Joel said, I will sit to judge the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest of the earth has come. It is ripe. Come, trample the grapes of the winepress. It is full and the vat is overflowing. And as though this angel who speaks cries to Christ, swing the sickle, harvest the earth, fulfill your judgment upon this earth. We tend to think of harvest as a lovely time of year. The crops are gathered in. All is safely gathered in ere the winter storms begin. And yet the harvest hymn has that thought of the gathering in. Gather thou thy people in, free from sorrow, free from sin. In this passage, when it's spoken about, Lord, swing your sickle over the earth. It is time, it is ripe, this harvest. So he, Jesus, verse 16, who was seated upon the throne on the cloud, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. You can understand this in two ways. He swings his sickle over the earth, that is, the whole earth, and the earth is harvested. Some think of that, yes. That would be that the believers, they are set aside, they are given to God, they are safe, they are in his care. And then the grapes being trampled is the unbelievers. 
But others wonder, is it because it's a sharp sickle? If you know anything about harvesting, if the old, not a, a tractor or a combine, but a hand-held sickle, it is near, it is aimed, it is sharp, it is total, a total sweep across the earth. So is it, some understand it like, is it the believers being a harvest and a harvest home in heaven? Or is it the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the praise, the songs, the one who came in the clouds to the earth? Is it a total judgment of sinners on the earth that sweeps right through? There is no escape. A dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And they are judged. Luke spoke about the severity of the judgment of God when Jesus comes on the earth. There will be signs in the sun, moon and stars. On the earth nations will be in anguish and in great, great perplexity. Even so, when you see these things happen, you know the kingdom of God is near. We all want a get out. It won't include me. Just through the week, I went to one of the stores, a large supermarket. It was very, very busy on a Saturday. Uh, I have a collar on whatnot. I was just going back. So I walked through the car park towards the, the exit, trying to work out with the one-way systems, uh, which way to go in. And then an attendant enthusiastic came, oh, your reverence, your reverence, come this way. And I went round and he showed me a queue. He said, no, 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 come this way. I looked and there was a queue of about 30 to 40 people. But I realized he saw the old caller and he said, oh, your reverence, come this way. And I thought, no, it's not my place to step in ahead of others. I said, thank you, I'll come again at another time. Sometimes in life we want to think we are a special priority. We can jump the queue to heaven. That we will not be worried or anxious about our eternal destiny. We've done our best. We've tried to be good. We haven't hurt or offended others deliberately. And maybe God will say, it's all right. Just, just no, you come on. You, you can come in this way. Don't worry about them. And yet the only way into the kingdom of heaven is the Lord Jesus, trusting and relying upon him. I just stepped aside and said, no, thank you. I don't want to go ahead of others. And for us, the harvest time has come. If we take it as it is the sharp sickle, the reaping of all, it's a reaping of all who do not believe. Christ will protect his own. Be sure where you stand. When he who comes in the clouds with the crown, the king of the kingdom, that before he lifts his hand and wields that sickle of judgment on the whole earth, it was swung right over the earth. There is no escape that you are in Christ and resting in him alone. So he from the clouds swung his sickle and the harvest of the earth was reaped. One person who spoke well of another, it's a story about two Davids, David Attenborough and David Livingstone. David Attenborough spoke well about David Livingstone's visit, his first coming to Africa. And David Attenborough mentioned it was right back to the time in 1853 when David Livingstone wanted to come to tell others yet to hear about Jesus before the harvest time of souls was coming of the Savior. Even back in the 1850s into Africa, this man came. Livingstone believed that Christ was Savior and Judge of all the earth, and he wanted others to hear that voice. So Livingstone arrived, we're told, by David Attenborough's account, on the Zambezi River. 
Livingstone paused at a little village, an outcrop of people right there on the banks of a massive Zambezi River. And Livingstone was obsessed by what he saw, the whole smell, the sounds, the heats, the being there for the sake of others in Jesus. He wanted to tell them of the Savior. And these words were written. For Livingstone, it was like a highway for him, a highway to the heart of Africa itself. News of Christ could travel. And so that little settlement of people, Livingstone put up his magic lantern, a projector. And from that little projector, the people amazed at what they could see and what this stranger was doing, he told them the Bible stories of Christ. We can touch a phone and have the whole Bible. Any question answered about the Bible, about Jesus, about God, about truth or about falsehood, about, about deception or delight, we can have the whole story. But from the temple in this 15th verse, when the angel cried, take your sickle and reap, the time to harvest the earth is ripe. When he who was seated upon the throne swung his sickle over the whole earth and the earth was harvested. It's the end. It's not the beginning. Prepare, said Amos, to meet your God. On the cloud, the Son of Man, the Savior, Lord and King. From the temple, the angel came and said, Lord, swing the sickle, bear your judgment. This is the time. Livingstone went to that great continent from which have come millions upon millions of believers who are now reaching out into the world to their own and to others in these last times and before the Lord swings his sickle of judgment on the earth. We need to be ready because there is no escape. It was over the whole earth. Death we think is that escape, but is it? Death is, someone said, the final agenda of this life, and we cannot avoid reaching it. But Hebrews tells us after death, the judgment, this is the time of judgment. And from the temple, in that vision, you have on the cloud the Lord Jesus. So there's the, the visual, the actual evidence. He is coming, lo, he comes. Every eye shall see him. But from the temple that cry, Lord, harvest, judge, deal with this earth. And we're told, Matthew wrote it. At that time, the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations of the earth will mourn they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. Today, Paul wrote, is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. And we think of songs. Lo, he comes on the clouds. But when he comes to judge, are we ready? There's a lovely song we sing. There is a hope that dwells within my heart. That is the resting place for the believer. And that's a place for an unbeliever, even while it is now, while it is time, before he comes to bow down and trust in Christ and in him alone. There is a hope.
rest my weary head. A consolation strong against despair. But when the world has plunged me in its deepest pit, I find the Saviour there. Through present sufferings, futures fear, He whispers courage in my ear. For I am safe in everlasting arms, and they will lead me home. There is a hope that stands the test of time, that lifts my eyes beyond the beckoning grave, to see the matchless beauty of the day divine when I behold his face. When suffering cease and sorrows die, and every longing satisfied, then joy unspeakable will flood my soul, for I am truly home. When suffering cease and sorrows die, and every longing satisfied, then joy God's speak up will fill my soul, for I am truly home. The third thought is, where is Jesus coming to? Where would the angels of the earth look down and say, Lord, finish your work? that great salvation. It is on the earth. The clouds had Christ. The saints sung their praise. The time had come from the temple. The angel cried, Lord, bring in your harvest. Judge the earth. But on the earth, what must be done? The curse of sin must be crushed. The curse of sin must be crushed. And this is the last few verses there in that 14th chapter. Verse 17. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven. He too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. For he comes, he comes to judge the earth. Let's read this passage. We're not sure, is this Jesus who tramps down the grapes in the wine press? Is it an angel? Is it both? We're not told. But in Israel, a wine press wasn't just on a flat floor. There was, think of a hill. What they'd done is they'd cut a great groove on the top around the hill, and on that they put the wine, the grapes that were going to be crushed. The grapes were there, and they would have gone round in that great wine press and crushed the grapes, crushed the grapes until they were flattened, and then the juice flowed out and down a gully to a second, which was a greater one still, and they crushed and crushed and crushed, and it flowed down, and it filled that gully where it be gathered, and it then just flowed on. There is a severity in the judgment of God. This isn't a sub-Christian passage of the Bible of brutality. This is to show sin must be dealt with, Satan defeated, all crushed, ended totally, completely, finished forever. In it, when God is judge, he will finish that judgment on the earth. As it were, the realm of grace, the age of grace has ended. 
Verse 7 in chapter 14 tells us about fear God, give him the glory. And another verse speaks about the gospel being proclaimed throughout the earth. But the realm, the time of grace has ended. It is the severity of the judgment of God on sin and sinners. It was acted out. The realm of grace. As though God's fury. We use that word carefully, speaking of fury. Christ speaks of God's wrath being poured out fully, not in parts. And then the the last verse of the chapter shows about a, a flowing out They were trampled, that is, the grapes, the winepress outside the city. Blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridle for a distance of 1,600 stadia, about 180 miles. Some take that figure of 1,600, four fours, every corner of the earth. Take it also as you think of the the thousand part, ten tens, they think of that. They think of the, the whole and the whole of humanity, ten tens, a complete number. It is a total judgment. The four fours, the four corners of the earth, four four sixteen, and then the tens or the thousands, that's think of a total judgment. There is no end of the fury of God until it is complete, it is finished, it is done. A dreadful thing to fall to the hands of a living God. How is sin crushed? Back in Genesis, when the deceiver Satan appeared in the garden at Eden and was challenged by God for what he had done, we were told about that. You bite his heel. He will bruise or crush your head. Even there, when sin had come, God had said one day under the feet of God. Sin and Satan will be crushed, will be finished, will be dealt with forever. That is a solemn song for which the saints could give thanks. All the evil, all the injustice, all the persecution, all the hatred, all the enemies of God and his Christ, one day all Satan, the false ones who follow him, the many with the mark of the beast who believe in him, they one day will be crushed under the great wine press of God, total, finished, dealt with, the full judgment of God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Our God is marching on.
There is a finish to evil. There is a time which God will deal with sin beginning through to end. It was written by Paul in the book of Ephesians. His incomparably great power at work within us who believe. In Christ who was raised from the dead, and God will place all things under his feet. Jesus will judge beginning to end. And are we ready? They say a man's last words never lie. The Lord Jesus Christ, hours before he went to the cross, looked at people who hated him and would condemn him to death. People who were going to hell. These were religious rulers of Israel who nailed Jesus to the cross, who spat in his face, slapped him and said, prophesy Christ who did this. And one of the last things that Jesus said, and a man's last words never lie, said this, but I say to you all in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. How do we understand this? The Saviour in the clouds, the angels saying, Lord, harvest and reap, crush sin and finish with judgment. How do we understand it? One man said, it's the cutting down of the wicked and the gathering of the righteous. As Amos said, prepare to meet your God. You can without fear, in that line of life, we see him now is a day of salvation. Now is the time. Trust in Christ. It was Christ possibly who thought of these finishing words of Isaiah. I have trodden the winepress alone. From the nations, no one was there with me. I trampled them down in my anger and trod them in my wrath. Her blood splattered all my garments, and I stained all my clothing. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave me support. So my own arm worked salvation for me, and in my, and my own wrath, it sustained me to finish the work. Many crimes, one crime, one judge, one judgment. Let us flee to Christ and find peace and help in our time of need. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Lord, you are altogether righteous, great and holy. You are gracious, compassionate, merciful and good. You have given us many invitations to come to you. And so we come with our sin, our trouble, our mistakes, our cares and our sorrows. What would we do if we could not come before you, God? To whom else would we go? There is no other in all the earth who could help us. And so we gladly say, that we need no other help but yours, God. Thank you for all that you have been teaching us through the book of Revelation. Thank you that the war in heaven has been won through Jesus's death. Even though we may face persecution, suffering and hardship now, thank you 
that the battle is decided and that the evil one will not ultimately win. Lord, you call us to endure and remain faithful to Jesus, even if it is costly. Thank you for the secure inheritance kept in heaven for those who trust in you. They will have rest and they will be found singing around your throne on Mount Zion. Lord, until that time, help us to keep our eyes intent on your victory through Jesus. Lord, we think of the world's sorrow. On every front, there appears to be grief and pain and suffering. We pray especially for homes that are in mourning. We think of those whose hearts are breaking. We bring before you those known to us who suffer through illness or other affliction. May they know Jesus as their tender-hearted saviour who brings comfort like no other. Help each of us to rest our heavy, troubled hearts in your hands. Thank you for the hope given to believers for resurrection and new life when Christ returns to make all things new. As we wait for that day, help us to set our hearts on pilgrimage. Keep us walking closely with you, God. We pray for all those in government and those making important decisions. Guide them and grant wisdom in all that they do. From those in positions of highest authority to those who remain quietly at home, we pray for any who cannot see the way through at this time. Grant faith in place of fear and fretting. Thank you that you will bring great glory to yourself through this ongoing health crisis. May we seek that more than we seek relief. We ask that you will bring glory to yourself, that your character revealed in scripture will be made known and that your gospel will be propagated in these days. We thank you for your church here in Kaluan. In this time of separation, we continue to pray for the people connected to this parish. As the weeks pass and we wonder how each person is, God, thank you that each one is known to you. Together or apart, help us to hold fast to truth. Your word reminds us that it is knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness and that ultimately sets us free. Help us to guard and hold fast to your word always. Lord, you are our light and our salvation. How could we ever begin to thank you for all that you have done for us? It seems that just a few words would be too many, yet thousands too few, to tell of your splendour and majesty. You are sovereign, and yet in your sovereignty, our ways are not hidden or insignificant in your sight. Lord, sometimes the caprice of this world would cause us to cry as the psalmist did, Oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Thank you that you remain our place of shelter far from the tempest of the storm. Satisfy us with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. And lead us from strength to strength until we appear before you in Zion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, gather thy, thy people in free from sorrow, free from sin. 
And may glory be his alone. In Christ's name. Amen.